John McAfee is on the run again, from authorities and for president. What's in the news was stories on buying guns with buyback money, voluntary conservationism, judicial mobile phone protection, Bill Weld, universal home visits for newborns, and secession. And yet another bad cop on a bit of justice while still protecting that thin blue line. This episode is brought to you by Zencash, now known as Horizon, a cryptocurrency that infuses privacy, anonymity, and security done right. Also brought to you by SmartCash, an easy-to-use, fast, and secure cryptocurrency that supports everyday use for everyday transactions. Welcome to The Lava Flow, channeling the flow of information to the libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, and agorist community. Find us at thelavaflow.com. Here's your host, Roger Paxton. Thank you for joining me this week. From the state that is the second lowest in the nation for unemployment, this is the show that will bring you the people, places, and events that everyone in the Liberty Rebellion needs to know. You can catch me on Twitter at the Lava Flow Pod. This is episode 118, McAfee Running Again. And it's Tuesday, January 29th, 2018, when there have already been more than 56 people killed by police this year. And the United States debt clock shows us that more than $21,962,900,000,000 in debt. What's wrestling my jimmies this week? You're about to find out. Let's do it to it. John McAfee, who sought the Libertarian Party presidential nomination in 2016, is on the run from authorities yet again. This time, he says a grand jury in Tennessee has charged him with felonies due to his not paying taxes to the Internal Revenue Service for eight years, nor has he filed any returns. McAfee is now fleeing the United States on a boat and is adamant that he will conduct his presidential campaign in exile. McAfee said in a two-minute video that he posted on Twitter from the boat that he fled in, quote, We are today at war. I have not paid taxes for eight years. I have made no secret of it. Today, January 22nd, the IRS has convened a grand jury in the state of Tennessee to charge myself, my wife Mrs. McAfee, four of my campaign workers with unspecified IRS crimes of a felonious nature. They want to silence me. I will not allow that. I am running my campaign in exile on this boat for the duration. I will not allow them to imprison me and shut my voice down, which they will do immediately. Why? I am a flight risk. Obviously, I am in flight. Today, crypto community, we are at war, and I am on the front lines. McAfee supposedly was fleeing to Venezuela based on his tweets, which is an excellent strategic move since the United States has a bad relationship with Venezuela. However, it appears he ended up in the Bahamas. In a tweet he posted a couple of days ago, he says, Recruiting campaign volunteers for exile headquarters in Georgetown, the Eximas, must be self-supporting, have made arrangements with locals for reasonable housing and lodging. Email 2020exile at gmail.com for details. Three rooms left on the Yacht Club, $1,200 a month, many in town. Unfortunately for McAfee, the Bahamas do have extradition with the U.S., so if he truly has been indicted, as he says, it's not going to be any issue for the U.S. to get to him where he is. Not a terribly smart move on his part, if all of that is true. Interestingly, McAfee is still trying to run his presidential campaign from outside the U.S. and on the run. In one video where McAfee had his campaign manager, Rob Loggia, on a wireless speaker, McAfee said that his flock of masked volunteers will make appearances in his stead across the U.S. and that he would talk through them using wireless speakers. Loggia said the idea came from Asian politicians who have tried similar, similar antics. McAfee said, I am running my campaign in exile on this boat for the duration. I will not allow them to imprison me and shut my voice down. Rob and one of our other volunteers are creating masks of my face, which are going to be given to thousands of people in two different groups. First, our road warriors, who once a month are going to appear in parks, street corners, restaurants all around America, while I speak through loudspeakers through them. Group two are the people who will be going to conferences doing keynotes. I will be going to conferences as a surrogate. I will be looking at people through a camera, asking questions, shaking hands as I tell my surrogate to shake hands, and speaking. This is how we're going to do it. Look, whether that campaign will be with the Libertarian Party or some other party is yet to be known. 
But as someone who supported McAfee's 2016 campaign, I certainly hope he doesn't run for the LP ticket this time. As I've said on this show many times before, the only thing the LP should be doing is educating people about libertarianism, not trying to win elections. That message of educating people would be severely diluted by McAfee's shit show if he were to run as an LP candidate again. Have you subscribed to the Lava Flow on iTunes or any mobile device yet? Then what's wrong with you? Go to thelavaflow.com slash subscribe so you don't miss a minute of the show. And while you're subscribing, make sure to leave me a five-star rating and review the show to help others find our podcast. Thelavaflow.com slash subscribe. Are those dry, boring, run-of-the-mill political talk shows putting you to sleep on your commute or at work? Are you ready for some fun? Look no further. Blast off with Johnny Rocket is a Seattle-based podcast expressing viewpoints of free markets, voluntary exchange, badass music, wicked banner, and of course, drinking. The Blast Off doesn't shy from the truth, but always brings the party. Let's rock and roll, Raylene. Bring it on, Johnny. You can check us out at thelaunchpadmedia.com forward slash blast off. Again, that's thelaunchpadmedia.com forward slash blast off. Launchpad Media. Always launching ideas in your direction. What's in the news? The news you need to know from a libertarian perspective. In Not All Heroes Wear Capes News, a Missouri man sold his firearms made out of scrap metal and garbage to a gun buyback program and then used the money to buy a real gun. YouTuber Royal Nunsuch made a quick $300 by taking three firearms that he'd built out of scrap and selling them back to the state of Missouri. He described two of the pipe guns as the crappiest guns I've ever made, but was still able to successfully sell them off to the program. Nunsuch told the man, who handed over $300 without confirming or inspecting the guns for himself, I had three. They're in that guy's car. The man said during the transaction, here you go, go away. The guns that he sold included a 22 zip gun style rifle as well as a 12-gauge grappling hook gun. They were functional, but by no means a practical weapon or method of defense. During the buyback program, the guns were bought out of the coordinator's cars, as the building that hosted the event was a gun-free zone, which we know from history is incredibly effective at keeping areas safe and gun-free. This guy deserves a huge bow. In volunteerism news, the creator of the online video game Fortnite, Tim Sweeney, has made good on his promise to protect undeveloped and biodiverse land in the picturesque Western Carolina mountains for future generations. Since 2008, Sweeney has spent millions on conservation projects in his home state of North Carolina to protect and preserve its forest land. He has purchased nearly 40,000 acres over the last decade, making him one of the largest private landowners in the state. Sweeney has also donated money to several conservation parcel projects, including a 1,500-acre expansion to Mount Minchel State Park. By purchasing the land, Sweeney helped protect hundreds of endangered plant and animal species. According to biologist Kevin Caldwell, ecologists documented more than 130 rare and watchless plants and wildlife species, and several new-to-science wildlife and plant species, including three moths and a new spiderwort species. After the purchase, Sweeney remarked, It's one of the most diverse areas in North Carolina. It has such rare plant and wildlife species that seemed a perfect fit with the Fish and Wildlife Service. This is the first step. There will be other places protected. The goal is to connect South Mountains State Park to Chimney Rock. This is one piece of the puzzle. A year later, Sweeney purchased 193 acres of Alamance County for $1.973 million from Sizemore Brothers, LLC. Last year, the video game mogul purchased a 1,500-acre parcel of land known as Stone Hills that was being considered for development as a golf resort community. Following the purchase, Sweeney stated he intends to preserve the land for its natural beauty. I bought this land because it has a nice long-leaf pine forest and was available for a reasonable price. I'll be holding it until I find a permanent nature conservation home for it, which will take years or decades. 
When asked what he intends to do with the land in the short term, Sweeney replied, I just plan to hike it and do some tree thinning and burning for ecosystem restoration until I find a permanent cons conservancy or state home for it. Here it is, folks, proof positive that you don't need the government to preserve land. Yes, we're not all billionaires, but we all have the ability to collectively pull our resources together to do basically the same thing without sticking guns in people's faces and stealing money from them. Hats off to Tim Sweeney. Zencash has changed their name to Horizon to better represent their transition from a pure cryptocurrency to a pioneering platform that protects consumer data. They're focusing more on the wider vision of what Zencash was all about. The new name, Horizon, reinforces that the project is forward-thinking and visionary and will broaden the horizons of what the community can accomplish in the world using the platform. Not only is it one of the best privacy-oriented cryptocurrencies with zero-knowledge technology built into it, but they also have private chat over their network. And soon, Horizon will include the ability to publish information and go anywhere on the web, all with complete privacy. They are working toward the day when anyone will be able to build privacy-based applications on the Horizon platform and generate income from them. This will allow Horizon to bring thousands of real-life services to the community. Services that provide freedom, utility, and privacy. The unique spelling of Horizon is a nod to their heritage and recognizes that they remain committed to the vision that their project was built upon. Their coin and ticker symbol remains Zen. So Zencash is now Horizon, and Horizon is bringing privacy to life. You can learn more at horizon.global. That's H-O-R-I-Z-E-N dot global. In even a broken watch news, a California judge has ruled that American cops can't force people to unlock a mobile phone with their face or finger. The ruling goes further to protect people's private lives from government searches than any before and is being held as a potential landmark decision. Previously, U.S. judges had ruled that police were allowed to force unlock devices like Apple's iPhone with biometrics, such as fingerprints, faces, or irises. This was despite the fact that feds weren't permitted to force a suspect to divulge a passcode. The order came from the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California in the denial of a search warrant for an unspecified property in Oakland. The warrant was filed as part of an investigation into a Facebook extortion crime, in which a victim was asked to pay up or have an embarrassing video of them publicly released. The cops had some suspects in mind and wanted to raid their property. In doing so, the feds also wanted to open up any phone on the premises via facial recognition, a fingerprint, or an iris. While the judge agreed that investigators had shown probable cause to search the property, they didn't have the right to open all devices inside by forcing unlocks with biometric features. Judge Westmore declared that the government did not have the right, even with a warrant, to force suspects to incriminate themselves by unlocking their devices with their biological features. The judge wrote, if a person cannot be compelled to provide a passcode because it is a testimonial communication, a person cannot be compelled to provide one's finger, thumb, iris, face, or other biometric feature to unlock that same device. The magistrate judge decision could, of course, be overturned by a district court judge, as happened in Illinois in 2017 with a similar ruling. The best advice, though, for anyone concerned about government overreaching into their smartphones Stick to a strong alphanumeric passcode that you won't be compelled to disclose. In OG Libertarian news, former Governor William F. Weld is headed to New Hampshire soon, and don't count him out of the 2020 mix, either as a Libertarian or a Republican. Weld has snagged a highly sought-after invitation to speak at the New England Council and St. Anselm's College Politics and Eggs series on February 15th, where he should shed more light on his White House ambitions. The breakfast speeches have become must-make events for presidential candidates. One can only hope that, if he does decide to run, he does do so as a Republican, because having his name associated with the term libertarian again will only confuse people about what libertarianism is once again. And, as we know, Rothbard bless him, the LP has shown it loves its shiny things, so I would put money on Weld getting the LP nomination if he did run as a libertarian. Smart Cash is an easy-to-use, fast, and secure cryptocurrency that supports everyday use for everyday transactions. Smart Cash is focused on getting the currency back into cryptocurrency 
and their vision is to replace centralized fiat currencies in day-to-day life. Too many cryptos talk about being used as a currency, but they are all focused on something else and leave user experience for both merchant and customer by the wayside. Smart Cash is focused on being used for business payments and POS through such features like their Instant Pay, which allows for trusted transactions in a second, powered and secured by their 20,000 user run smart nodes. Smart Cash also has a Smart Hive proposal system that is funded by the blockchain, where any user can put forth a project proposal to expand the community, ecosystem, or technology. Holding one smart equals one vote, so all users can participate in voting without having to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to run a full node. The people working on Smart Cash are broken up into six different Smart Hive structuring teams with dedicated team members that are completely funded by the blockchain. There is no CEO, no foundation, no centralized leadership, and there is no need for outside investors to come in and compromise any deals. Check out Smart Cash today at thelavaflow.com slash smart to find out how they are putting the cash into Smart Cash and the currency into cryptocurrency. I believe this is truly a ground floor opportunity to get in on a rising tide. Get a wallet and find an exchange to purchase Smart Cash at thelavaflow.com slash smart. In cradle-to-grave news, if Oregon Governor Kate Brown has her way, the Beaver State will become the first in the nation to require universal home visits for newborn children in the care of their own parents. Senate Bill 526, introduced this month in the Oregon Legislative Assembly as part of Brown's budget, orders the Oregon Health Authority to study home visiting by licensed health care providers. Lawmakers went so far as to declare that SB 526 is an emergency measure one that requires a resolution by the end of the year. The intro to the bill, the language of which has not been crafted yet, reads, The Oregon Health Authority shall study home visiting by licensed health care providers in the state. The authority shall submit findings and recommendations for legislation to an interim committee of the Legislative Assembly related to health care not later than December 31, 2019. Moreover, the 18 sponsors of the bill claim that its passage is necessary for the immediate preservation of the public peace, health, and safety, and therefore an emergency is declared to exist. Government agents monitoring the homes of law-abiding parents who have not been accused of a crime without a warrant is an unconscionable violation not only of parental rights and individual liberty, but also a trampling of the Fourth Amendment and the Due Process Clause of the Constitution. Not that that Constitution has ever done anything to stop government from ignoring the document as they see fit. Unfit to exist. In secession news, there is a very real chance that New York State may split from New York City. The Washington Post reports that secessionists have been working behind the scenes in New York to split the state into two, or possibly even three different regions. The hope is to help out the state's struggling economy. Many residents in the Hudson Valley and upstate regions claim high taxes and tough regulations have been harmful to businesses. Well, no shit. Some also believe that New York City's liberal views don't reflect those of the rest of the state. While the idea of breaking up the state isn't new, the fact that it could actually happen is something that is getting people to take the idea even more seriously. The way the split might happen is if voters choose to hold a constitutional convention. The state allows a convention to be held every 20 years, and the next one would be eligible in 2019. At the convention, representatives from the different regions around the state can make changes to the state's constitution without having to get approval from lawmakers or the governor. Those changes, however, would need to be voted on by New Yorkers during the 2019 election. A Sunny New Paltz professor of political science spoke with the Washington Post about the possibility of a constitutional convention actually happening. Gerald Benjamin told the paper, Right now, I think we're the underdogs on this. I think we have a chance, but we are the underdogs. Boy, wouldn't that be worth seeing. I'd pay good money for seats to see the state of New York put New York City and its high taxes and socialist policies in their rearview mirror for sure. Exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per episode donation of as little as a buck an episode. Or use Bitcoin. Get exclusive content, rewards, and help the lava flow become fiscally neutral while providing you more content. Thelavaflow.com slash support. 
time to shake up your podcast feed, folks, by subscribing to Lions of Liberty, the only libertarian variety show out there. Spend Mondays with me, Mark Clare, as I feature in-depth interviews with great names in the libertarian community and fun roundtable discussions. Electric Liberty Land with me, Brian McWilliams, every Wednesday, your weekly dose of comedy, culture, and liberty. And Felony Fridays with me, John Odermatt, where I expose injustice in the broken criminal justice system. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and at lionsofliberty.com. This is Chris Spangle, and I am the host of We Are Libertarians, which you can find in iTunes, Google Play, or at wearelibertarians.com. We are a podcast that brings you all of the irreverence that modern politics deserves by examining current events from a libertarian perspective. So please, check us out at wearelibertarians.com. This is what happens when you call the cops. Say what? This is what happens when you call the cops. Come on. This is what happens when you call the cops. You get your rights violated or you all get shot. This is what happens when you As happens every once in a while, there are a ton of news in a single week showing a bevy of bad cops. This week, though, there's a case that it was a big surprise to me, as it shows a cop actually getting his just desserts for murdering a man, or at least close. That's pretty rare, and it's great to see it when it happens. However, three others got away scot-free for defending the thin blue line. On the night of the shooting in question in October 2014, Jason Van Dyke and other officers were responding to reports that McDonald was carrying a knife and breaking into cars in the city's southwest side. Van Dyke at his trial testified that he feared for his life when he encountered the teenager, who was holding a folded knife. But dashcam footage showed that Van Dyke was moving closer toward McDonald, while the teenager was veering away from officers in the middle of the street. McDonald's death sparked racial tensions, a federal investigation, and political upheaval in the city. And the video was released following intensive public pressure and calls from activists for police accountability. Now keep in mind, the last time a Chicago police officer was convicted of murder for an on-duty killing was more than 50 years ago. Van Dyke's defense team had requested probation for the 13-year veteran of the Chicago Police Department and submitted more than 100 letters from family, friends, and co-workers who noted he had no prior criminal record and deserved leniency. The prosecution also highlighted complaints against Van Dyke for allegedly using excessive force and featuring testimony from minorities who claimed he abused their civil rights during arrests. Edward Nance, who won a $350,000 civil judgment after his arrest by Van Dyke and his partner during a 2007 traffic stop, cried on the stand as he explained how he was manhandled and remains in constant pain every day from the incident. Despite over 20 complaints against him, Van Dyke was never disciplined once during his career. Never disciplined. He was allowed to continue to think that his actions were appropriate over and over. This guy was a repeat offender, and the city knew it, and seemingly encouraged it by never disciplining him. Yet they put him back on the streets. Fuck the Chicago PD in the neck with a bad cop. A jury back in October of last year found Van Dyke guilty of second-degree murder and 16 counts of aggravated battery in the death of Laquan McDonald, 17. He was sentenced last week to six years and nine months in prison. Jason Van Dyke's punishment was far less than the minimum of 18 years that prosecutors were seeking, although state sentencing guidelines allowed for as many as 96 years or more, the equivalent of six years served consecutively for each shot he fired. At the sentencing hearing, the Reverend Martin Hunter, McDonald's great-uncle, spoke on behalf of the family and read a letter that was written as if McDonald had penned it himself. Hunter read, Please think about me and about my life when you sentence this person to prison. Why should this person be free when I am dead forever? So there is some good news in this story. I mean, he should have been sentenced much more, in my opinion. And had you or I pulled the trigger, we certainly would have been sentenced more harshly. But at least this is some small justice for McDonald's death. Sadly, though, three other officers who wrote reports about this exact murder that were wildly different than what the dash cam video actually showed were acquitted on charges of conspiracy, obstruction of justice, and official misconduct by a judge. These officers stuck by the code of silence brought about by the thin blue line to protect their colleague, period. 
and they're getting away with it scot-free. All this does is encourage officers to protect their own, even when they are grossly negligent or criminal. One of the officers told investigators that McDonald was walking toward Van Dyke and with his arms raised when he was shot, a version of evidence completely contradicted by the dash cam footage. Another of the officers signed off on allegedly false reports that said the officers were injured in their encounter with McDonald, prosecutors said. No officer was injured at all. Officer Dora Fontaine testified that she never saw McDonald threaten any officers at the scene at all, but that one of the indicted officers instructed her to make up that allegation in a report. Fontaine testified, Other officers were calling me a rat, a snitch, a traitor, said they wouldn't back me up. If I was on a call-in and needed assistance, some officers felt strong enough to say that I didn't deserve to be helped. And there you have the crux of the issue, folks. One officer, out of all of these officers, steps forward with the truth, and the rest circle their wagons around the thin blue line and essentially threaten that one officer. How much do you want to bet Fontaine doesn't stay a cop much longer? The good cops always either quit in disgust or get pushed out. There is no room for a good apple in the bunch. Thank you for listening to the show this week. As always, I need to thank my favorite hostess with the most is Jessica for her help with the show. For the show notes of this episode, where I put links and other information that's been on this show, go to thelavaflow.com slash 118. I have a new supporter through Bitbacker using crypto this week. Johnny Voluntary became a $5 per month crypto subscriber using Bitcoin Cash. Thank you so much, Johnny. You rock. So thanks to Johnny and all of my awesome supporters, I am now at $252.5 per episode, or 50.5% of the way towards my next goal of $500 per episode. Thank you for all your support, guys, really. Remember, when I hit this next goal, I will be upping the content I bring you from half an hour per week to a full hour. I know you want more content from me, and I really want to give it to you. So add your pledge today to help me bring you twice the lava flow that you're getting today. So go exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per episode donation of as little as a buck an episode using Federal Reserve Notes through Patreon or monthly through Subscribestar or using cryptocurrencies through Bitbacker. I want to be able to bring you more content soon, so make sure to add your donation today to help make that happen. I don't have any new Apple Podcast reviews this week, but if you have a minute and you want to hear your review read right here on the show, please go to thelavaflow.com slash apple and leave me a rating and a review. All the cool kids are doing it. Thank you to everyone who's left me a rating and a review so far. You guys rock. To all of you who haven't, can you guys help me out and go leave a review for me? Go to thelavaflow.com slash apple to do that now. Until next time, keep striking the root. Thank you for listening to The Lava Flow at thelavaflow.com. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe now at thelavaflow.com forward slash subscribe. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast. <laughs>